I like learning new things. And for me, work doesn't feel like work because it's, I'm doing the things I like and it's my vehicle for learning. I think that's how you stay young and your brain stays plastic. How's it going? I'm Justin. Justin Kahn from Justin.tv. Justin Kahn, an entrepreneur and investor. Most of you probably know him for building Twitch and selling it, of course, to Amazon for a billion dollars. What's your best advice for entrepreneurs? My best advice for people who want to be entrepreneurs is like, you just got to get started. I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. So talk us through the concept of Justin.tv. How did that even get started? How did you think that that could be a good idea? I don't know that most people thought there would be a need for it because I mean, Justin TV. So the idea was I was going to strap a camera to my head and stream my life to the Internet 24 seven. And this is kind of back before there was social media. Right? We came up with the idea at the end of 2006. I think Twitter came out six months later and you know there was no Instagram. I guess it was the kind of counterintuitive idea would be a nice way to put it. But what happened was I, we had this other startup called Kiko, which was like this online calendar. It's kind of like Google Calendar, except it had no users. And it failed. The Google Calendar came out. It was much better in every way. We ended up selling it. We yellowed it on eBay and sold it to this other tech company. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and so then we were like, okay, now what do we do? Our mentor, Paul Graham, who is the founder of Y Combinator, it's an investment fund. He was like, you should start another company. And so we didn't really have any, we had one idea. We went and pitched him this idea. It was kind of a dumb idea. But it was basically like if you had a blog, you could print out content from your, your online blog into a book, right? And sell a book to your fans. And then he was like, he was a big blogger. He was like, I have, you know, I would never do this. Like, I, so do you have any other ideas? And we kind of reached in my back pocket of ideas. I was like, okay, I have this idea for this thing called Justin TV. It's kind of crazy. And it's like us making our own live show on the internet. And at the time, there was like, this wasn't really, you know, there was YouTube, but there was no YouTube live. There was no live content really on the internet. In fact, we didn't even know if it was technically possible, but, you know, I kind of always just assume things are going to work out for me. So I'm like, I just assume things are possible. So I'm like, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to make this live show. And, you know, he was kind of into it. He was like, oh, tell me more like what, you know, and I, I had this idea of like, it's going to be a window into the lives of like, we'll start with my show. It's like, you know, following this tech guy, building this tech startup. And then there could be one of like, you know, a fashion model in New York trying to make it in the modeling scene or somebody who's like, you know, diff basically an athlete or like a different walks of life, right? Like, so you have these windows into different people. And he was into it. And, you know, his, his, one of his partners at Y Combinator, uh, Robert Morris, who's his professor of computer science at MIT, he was there just hanging out. And he was like, Justin, I'll fund that. Just to see you make a fool of yourself. <laughs> so we walked out of there with a check for 50 grand. And, you know, that was a lot to us back then. We were like, oh, this is, you know, it's on. We're going to start this company. And so, I mean, long story short, our show sucked. You know, we spent all this time building this technology to make it. We launched it six months later and people showed up and they were like, your show is boring because it was a bunch of nerds sitting on their computer. Like, you know, we did, we had like one week's worth of content programmed. And then after that, I was just like on my computer. <laughs> And so people were like not into the show, but they were into, you know, they wanted to create their own streams or their own. They asked us, how are we doing this? Like, how are we making this technology work? And so that's what we were good at. We were engineers and we had like created the streaming platform. And so people, um, we were like the light bulb went off and we we're like, oh, let's make it into a platform for anyone to stream. But this was your whole life, right? It was 24 seven. You were streaming for, yeah. I think, eight months. It was like, yeah, seven months, but it broke all the time. So in theory, it was 24-7, but it was really like, you know, 18-7, <laughs> you know? Like it was, that first yeah. $50,000 check, what do you think he saw? Was he that interested in seeing your life or was he interested in the technology aspect? Or was he also seeing that this could be the start of social media and this curiosity of following other people? I think he thought, number one, these guys are smart. They had another co company. They didn't give up that easily. So they're, they're smart. They want to do something again. So I want to back smart founders who are motivated. I think number two, he was like, you know, there's something here with seeing these windows into people's lives. Like, I think he, I pitched it like that. And I think he was receptive to that. And so Paul wanted to fund it, you know. Is there anything that you gave up by showcasing your life 24 seven for those seven months? It was weird because, you know, a lot of people were looking at it and then there was a lot of, I mean, you know, anyone who's been online, of sufficient you know size of following you know is it that like it gets i mean people are rude some of some people so there was a lot of like you know i, I had to 
build a thick skin because people were like trolling me. They were like calling the cops on me. They were telling me how much I sucked. So once you realize, though, that the beauty of it wasn't just streaming your life, but streaming other people's lives, what happened next? Who was the second person to come on board or the TV show? So we, we kind of opened it up as a platform and then we started recruiting other people who were mostly who were viewers or had seen the thing. So there was like various people who were kind of we call it life casting. There were all these people who were like streaming their lives. There's this guy, Moon Cricket, who was a break dancer. There was this guy in uh, there's this couple in Japan. There was, you know, just various people who were like doing stuff. There was this fashion designer. And then there were like people who were trying to stream other things like a, like a, you know, kind of a talk show or a, you know, there's this early guy who wanted to do bicycle stream a bicycle race. And so there was like just all sorts of different stuff that people were trying to stream. And in those early stages, were you thinking about how will I monetize this? We just kind of assumed that we would put advertising on it at some point. But mostly it was, you know, a profoundly money losing venture in the, <laughs> in the beginning. Just because you had to hire so many people to develop the technology? It, was, it wasn't that big of a team. You know, we we're probably like less than 10 people, but there was a lot of cost in the bandwidth. You know, so we we're paying. I remember we had like that $50,000 check. And then like the first month we were streaming, the bandwidth bill was like $35,000. Oh, no. Yeah. So we're, we're like, this is the numbers don't. I mean, we're kind of like drawing, you know, trying to do all this complex math. And it was just like, mm, this is like Not bank account work. is like trending <laughs> to zero presently. So then did you have to go out and raise more money? Yeah, so we went and raised more. We went and raised a, you know, angel round. Our first angel round was like 300,000. Then after by the end of the summer after we launched, we got all this press for it and then we at the end of the at summer 2007 we were able to raise a 2 million dollar well it was a series A at the time but now we call it a seed round. In that summer when you raised that 2 million dollars, what did you envision the project the company would be? versus what it eventually became. Well, it was still we what we had pitched was we're going to have all these different streams and like it's a platform for other people to stream. So that was that kind of core idea in the beginning um, that we pitched to our investors. I mean, not in the beginning, very beginning, but right after we launched our show, we launched our show, people like swatted us. It was like, it was very stressful. And then we're like, we can't, we need to like figure out how to make this, you know, something better than what we're doing. Explain swatting for people who don't know. Oh, yeah. Is. So swatting is like a form of you know, I guess online abuse where your people are like watching you call the cops on you, you know, because they just want to see something happen on stream. It's pretty dangerous, actually, because, you know, they call in like a crime that's happening. And then people like like someone, the cops like kicked in our door with their guns drawn. Oh, time. my gosh. Yeah. And it happened all on camera. So it happened to you. That was you. Yeah. I mean, we, I was. Yeah, it was. You can, I think it's probably on YouTube. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How did you handle that? I mean, we were just kind of like, I was like, no, oh, don't, there's no stabbing in here, officer. Yeah. And then they, um, you know, it was pretty clear. It was just a bunch of nerds. Oh, they were fun, you know. Okay. So then how does the company then grow to what we know it as now? Yeah. So, okay. We opened it up as a platform and it kind of grew and grew and grew um, until it stopped growing. For like three years, it grew on and off and we scaled it a lot. We raised some more money, built our tech team, you know, so it was like maybe a 25 person company. And then it stopped growing for about a year and we're like, Anything that's not growing on the internet is dying, actually, because the internet's growing, right? Maybe not today, but like back then, like, you know, people are spending more and more time on the internet. And so we decided, like, this is not going to work. We need to figure out something else. And my co-founder, Emmett, uh, was like, the game. there were these nascent streams that were gaming streams. People were streaming StarCraft II at the time, which is like the game that had just come out. And so he was like, let's focus on gaming. And the rest of us, I mean, my other two co-founders were like, that's a fucking dumb idea because nobody wants to watch people play video games on the internet. I was kind of in the middle. I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of into it, but I don't know how big it is. And so um, we decided to like focus on gaming and uh, with a little bit like some resources in the company. So we did we did some focus on gaming and then it like kind of started growing and then we recruit more streamers and then it that's that was the seed of Twitch. That's how Twitch got started. Did you see the traction right away that people were interested in watching other people stream their games? There was already some on Justin TV. So it was like a couple hundred thousand people a month were watching video game content. People streaming other people play video games. Then like it grew. We were like, okay, if we can grow 15% a month for the first year and 10% a month for the second year. That will mean that like by the end of two years, we'll become the biggest video game video site off of YouTube. And so it kind of blew out. That was our goal. And then the first six months, it just blew out our goal. Really, because Emmett was start, started talking to the customers. He was like, started talking to all these streamers, like, how can I get you to stream our site and stream more? And like, what are the things that you want? And then we started building. 
How does that work? I guess I'm not a gamer, so I don't understand. Is the reason that people want to watch other people play the game to understand the strategy or is it just entertainment the way people watch football or what is it? I think it's it's mostly just entertainment. You can kind of think of it like talk radio, you know, like or like morning shows or something like that. You know, you're just with these people. A lot of people watch Twitch, you know, um, sometimes it's a second screen activity or they're watching, you know, following along, they're browsing the internet also, but they're like kind of this person is just like talking about the game and what's happening and you know they're just like an entertainer and then the game and playing these games is like a convenient medium of like it's a, something to do right mm -hmm. something to discuss just like kind of like how in talk radio you might they do like celebrity news and they just talk about the story and celebrity news stories of the day it's not like anybody really cares about their <laughs> right they're, they're just like it's just something to talk about you know yeah i guess separates the people who are very good at live streaming versus not so good is it more the entertainment aspect so as you're doing that chit chat as you're playing the game you have to be kind of entertaining in the way you speak yeah you're you're high energy you know people are charismatic and high energy like YouTube, you can, it supports, like if you're good at YouTube, like I think you can make, it's like all about the format of the video and like a thumbnail and how do you like, what's the clickbait, you know, like what's the story of the video that gets someone really engaged and mm -hmm. then how do you, you know, and then there's like a lot of editing to make it like tight, right? But with, with um, Twitch, like none of that exists. Live video, it's more about you being off the cuff and then feeling a connection to you and also you being high energy to like entertain people. So oh. if you look at like the people who are like super popular on Twitch, like Aiden Ross or like Kai Sinet or whatever, they're like, they're like just super high energy, you know? Yeah. And they're like, they're just like, they can do that for eight hours a day or whatever, you know, yeah. like most people can't be on, you know, t t Twitch rewards you the way the system works. It rewards you for being on a lot. And I mean, it's kind of a grind to be honest. Like I wouldn't do it and I wouldn't be good at it because like, I'm not going to be on there eight hours a day, you know, seven days a week or six days yeah, a week. I yeah, I would not either. Yeah. At that time when you first started, how were people monetizing, earning money from being on Twitch? And then how do they earn money now? Is it different? Yeah, it started off as mostly video ads. So like very early on, people were like, I want to make money. And one of the insights that we had was like, you know, when we tried to get other types of content, because we tried to explore buying sports content and stuff on Justin TV before, they wanted like, even for events, like I remember we talked, we we're like, oh, we could buy the surfing event. And they were wanted like $50,000 to stream it online. We're like, I don't think we're going to recoup. And so then, but when, when we started streaming video games that some of these guys were like, you know, they were doing this as their hobby. And we started asking like, how much, you know, would you need to, you know, they were like, we want to make money. And we're like, oh, okay, how much money? And some, I remember one guy was like 50 bucks a month. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Like you could potentially make 50 bucks a month. Cause I mean, he was working, you know, at, at a, like not that, highly paid wage of a job mm -hmm. as a full-time job so that fifty dollars is meaningful to him so that kind of opened our eyes to like oh we should like let people make any amount of money even amount of money for us that seemed like kind of small and so then we we um created this ad platform that was like those in-stream ads you know so when you were playing to your audience you could like trigger an ad and then that would be revenue generative for you and it was just a share process so you split it between the company yeah and like we shared it you know we did it uh, shares, we took some of the ad revenue, they got some. And, you know, in general, it was about, I want to say in the beginning, it was like 50 50, but maybe like some people would get 60 40 or something. We got, you know, it was like a custom deal every time because there weren't that many people. Yeah. And you then know? now, if if I'm getting this correctly, people can donate to their favorite streamers. Is and that so now that's changed to be more streamer payments. Like people are donating, they're like subscribing. So they're doing like a monthly subscription to their, to their favorite streamer or they're just like donating money on stream. What were kind of the, decisions that you made in those early years that were fundamental to the success that Twitch eventually found? Yeah, so number one thing that was most important to Twitch's success was identifying who the customer was. And so, you know, there's multiple different parties on on Twitch, right? There's the, the, the advertisers who are funding the whole thing. There's the viewers who are watching the content. And there's the streamers who are creating the content. And very early on, my, my co-founder Emmett was like, the customer is the streamer. Like if we get the best content, the streamers to, to be on this platform, then the viewers will come. Even if the ex viewing experience sucks compared to like other places, like they're gonna come based on the where the content is. Yeah, You can see that in other places, like, you know, Netflix is a good example where like people come for the content. It doesn't really matter what the player looks like or you know, the discovery engine, really that, all that stuff. It's just the content is, is king. And so for us, it was like the streamers, the most important person, how do we, support the streamer best and like give them what they want and so the entire company is really built around was in that early 
days was built around that with you know partnerships program like there was like all these people who were in charge of like delivering the streamers a good experience we started helping them monetize we built a lot of features for them so at the time what was your role within the company because you had the other co-founders what was your big focus well, it changed over time so my role was like at first i was like programming some and then i was like the product person although i was not really that good of a product person to be honest and then when we started focusing on twitch i started doing more like marketing and business development stuff so it kind of changed my role changed over time what i'm really good at you know is sales types thing type of things like all the sales related things so fundraising recruiting of uh, talking to press i'm good at like uh, selling customers, you know, like anything that's storytelling, that's what yeah. I'm good. That's my strength. How did you, I guess, develop that skill set? Do you think it's innate? It's you're born with that, or there was something no, in the past so where I, you've developed that? I was not very, you know, confident or comfortable when I was younger. I think there's a couple things. Like number one, my mom is like really good at mirroring people. She she's like, I think she purposefully developed that skill set, and I think I kind of understand. I like copy or I like learn from her, like. I think I'm pretty un good at understanding what people like people's micro reactions to when you're talking and like how you're behaving, like interacting with them. And I think I'm pretty good at like telling a story that's like really receptive to people mm -hmm. and like people are vibing with and like understanding like how to shape that story um, for them to be maximally receptive. I think that's one thing. I think two, I'm pretty high energy and pretty like you know, when I'm into something, I'm like super into it. I have this like evangelical kind of component to my personality. So like, I just love talking about stuff that I'm into, yeah. you know? And so like, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about my, my art project, right? Like, I just love talking about stuff that I'm into. And so I think that helps, right? People are like kind of naturally buoyed by my excitement in something. So I think those two things are like kind of core components of like how I, why I'm like good at storytelling. You present very authentically to me. And I think for people who have that skill set where if you're very passionate about something, you're very excited and can talk about it. But then obviously sometimes the passion dies off, but you still just for business reasons need to like pretend to be passionate about mm. it. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about for <laughs> sure. I feel like that happens to me often, you know, because I'm always interested in new shit. Yeah. So what do you do when the passion kind of dies off, but you still need to sell the story? Either I go work on something else or I you know, try to find the thing that I'm really excited about. And usually that still exists, you know, like in some way there's like, I'm pretty excitable about things. So I like try to just tap into the thing that I'm really excited about, like the element of it and then focus on that. But, you know, some of the time it's like the excitement wearing off is a sign that like something is not working right, right? Like you can't just, you know, be all sales. So like I'm best when I partner with someone who's like a good product person, to develop like a good product and you know i've tried to be the product person in the past and i think i have like some good instincts but i like it's not my passion so i'm like never going to be the top of the game at it and so some of the time though like when you're selling something and you're like not excited about it oftentimes a reason for that is like the product isn't right or it's not working and then that's like a sign that you need to there's like something more deep that's like a problem you know was there an example that you were thinking about as you were describing that yeah so like i had this company called atrium right which uh, you might have read about or whatever, but it was this legal services startup. We ended up, you know, raising a ton of money because I had a lot of success. And then we, you know, I was selling, I was selling it and I was pretty good at selling it. Like I, we got hundreds of customers, you know, pretty quickly. And the problem was the retention was like quite poor of these clients. And so there was a problem with the product. And I mean, that was my fault. I was the CEO of the company, but like I wasn't focused enough on the product, but there was a problem with the product. And, and, so my excitement about selling it was like died over time because it was like clearly not working, you mm. know? That was a sign that like, hey, you need to go spend more time on product. How do you decide whether it's time to kill a project or it's time to pivot? Like there is that distinction, right? Whether, yeah. oh, it's maybe a matter of, oh, I have to keep working on it and trying different things versus, oh, it's a dead idea. It's just, there's no product market fit. Yeah, so, you know, with that company, we ended up, I was like, at a certain point, I was like this, is not a good business. It's not a venture scale business. You know, it's more of a services company, but it's never going to provide venture returns like our investors, like we, we promised our investors. And so for me, I was like, I wouldn't invest my own money in this company right now. And at that point, I was like, why am I continuing to spend other people's money on it? That doesn't make any sense. Like just to, because of momentum, we should return this capital or pivot, right? And so then we we're making that decision and we brainstormed, like I wanted to find something to pivot to, but I couldn't find something to pivot to that I really believed. Like that I was like, I think this is a good idea that I would 
spend my time and my money on. And if I wouldn't spend my own money on it or my own time on it, then like it doesn't make sense to like make the investors and, and employees go through this fire yeah. drill, you know. So we decided to shut it down. And that was controversial. My my team at the time was like, they were kind of like, fuck you, you know, we because they wanted to keep going with something. They liked working with each other. But you know, I think it was I was just like, this is for the best. I don't believe in these things. And I'm a pretty good investor. I'm a you know, I pretty I like I think I have a general I'm tapped into things at work. And so, you know, after we shut it down, everyone went and got other jobs. But I think they were in retrospect, some of them have come in and been like that. That was the right call. You know, because I mean, service based businesses are hard because if you want to double it, you have to double the employees or double. They There's don't have the returns of tech, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't scale like tech with tech or a product company. You make the product once and then you can like just crank that product and sell it more and more broadly. But with this service based company, you're kind of doing the service every time and the revenue you earned last month has to be re-earned next month and then the month after. Yeah. What kind of pressure does it put on you when you have to take on external capital? Do you think it impacts your decision making in a bad way? I don't know if it's bad. I think it's it just forces you to think about scale in a different way. You know, I'm thankful for external capital. For Twitch, it was really important because we couldn't have gone so long making so little money to grow like this this platform. And really none of the social media companies could have been existent without they couldn't have existed without external capital so it, external capital can allow you to build something that's like a longer term investment but at the same time it makes you go big right you have to have provide a big outcome and a story for how you're going to create that big outcome to get it and so it's you know it's kind of like you have to know what you want it's not for everybody a lot of people i think would be better served having a small business that scales with their own revenues and profits you know yeah and that's fine and oftentimes people you know, it can also make you make a better company that way and you retain more, you know. With Twitch, as you were scaling it, how were you thinking about profitability? Was it not so important to you because you were focused on the scale at the beginning? Yeah, at the beginning, it was like scaling it. And then at a certain point, like around 2009 or eight or nine, when the, you know, the kind of the, the great financial crisis happened, like there was this huge venture pullback. So we were like, oh, shit, we got to make money. So we started focusing on making money then. But for the first two years, we like made no money. Yeah. And the investors didn't care because they saw this. The yeah, it was like growth. growing. If the traffic's growing, you're going to make money eventually. I mean, YouTube like made no money and they sold for $1.6 billion. So like people were, people were like, there, you could make something valuable on the internet you know, yeah. that, that isn't monetizing yet. And obviously that was like a good acquisition by Google, right? Because they, you know, now it's like, it's probably worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It's like rivals TV, you know? Yeah, for sure. As you were getting closer to the 2014 acquisition, how did you kind of sense that you were at that stage where you could be acquired? Like, what are the indicators that you were looking at? Well, people, you know, there's this old saying, companies are bought, not sold. So like, if you want to sell your company, like the only way that happens is if there are people who are interested in buying it, they, they're coming to you wanting to buy it, right? And so people started coming around and they were like, you know, what are, what's going on? Like, it was a big site. So like, they were interested in figuring out how to partner or, you know, and eventually those partnerships conversations led into like people wanting to buy it. Why did they buy it for 970 million? Didn't you try to say like, okay, let's just increase. Yeah, they wouldn't. 30. I know exactly. <laughs> we were like, come on, you know, throw us a bone. They, I mean, they, it was actually over a billion before. And then they, at the last moment they changed, they were like, no, it, it was the new price. Oh no. And they repriced the deal on us. And <laughs> we were kind of like, so fatigued. We had been to various acquisition process i tell the story on my youtube channel but like we went through like you know trying to sell it to google and then it, we like it didn't work out and then you know yahoo and then that didn't work out and then amazon and then finally you know we were so fatigued we we're like you know what's the difference between you know 1.2 billion and 970 million like just do the deal what was that moment like when you actually signed the paperwork well there's like a couple moments that were like that i remember the first moment was when we got the first deal that was like a billion around a billion from Google, and I remember I'm talking to my co-founder Emmett on the phone, and he tells me they 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 gave us this offer, and I just felt I'm in a conference room. I fell on my knees and I just like laughing, like I was like that is ridiculous because six months before we thought the company's worth two hundred million dollars, maybe that was like my estimate. So this was like you know five times that we were like this incredible, and so that was one moment. Then then when we actually signed the paperwork with Amazon, I was actually at Burning Man. And I'd been working on this art car, which is like a transformed vehicle. It was like a, a, an iceberg. That was a, the first version, actually, of Titanic's end. And I'd been working on it all summer, and I brought it to Burning Man. I was like, I'm going to be off the grid. So we had the signatures for all the deal in escrow. Like, they had the lawyers had them. And brought this art project to Burning Man. There's no cell phone reception. Now there's, like, little ways to find internet 
but out there back then there was like no cell reception or anything. And so on Sunday night, I go to sleep in like this insulation foam hut that I'd made <laughs> with my brother. Like it was like a, like literally made of like the foam that goes in the, like in between your drywall. And um, it start, started raining. And I remember I woke up in the middle of the night and I'm like, is it raining out? And my brother's like, yep. And then we went back to sleep and I woke up in a pool of water, like an inch deep. Cause we had, we had like not made it wa sufficiently waterproof. Oh God. And so then I like, we, I spent my whole morning like dry, like trying to dry my shit out. Then I was like walking around trying to find someone with a cell phone connection or internet or anything to, so I could like text Emmett and see if the deal had transacted. Yeah. And then finally I found somebody and I was like texting him and he was, I was like, did everything go through? And he's like, yes. So that was like, that's the day I woke, you know, we did, we signed it. But then what happens is when you do a transaction like this is you need like government approval if it's for a certain amount. So you don't get paid mm -hmm. up front. So then it took about two months later, or maybe like a month and a half we, later, um, we were in Italy and we were trying, like we were at my co-founders, like my other co-founder, Kyle, he got married in Italy and we're at his wedding and we're at this castle in Italy, like a kind of like Run it was it wasn't bad, but it wasn't like super glamorous. It was like this these castles like turned into the event spaces, but it was super cold in there because it's yeah. not insulated. So with this castle in Italy, it's like, I don't know, late September or mid-October, something like that. And I'm trying to like see we're supposed to get paid this day. And so I'm like trying to see I'm I have that like Bank of America app on my phone and I'm like <laughs> refreshing, you know, it does it like it's pulling it down and it does a like, little circle wheel and it just like never completed. But then finally I got one it to go through and then I just like Bank of America, you know, my Bank of America app, I was like, I can't believe I have this much money in Bank of America. Like, I didn't even oh know it could gosh. fit that much money, you know? And it was, it was like a wild moment because everybody, you know, like a lot of the people who were there were from Twitch. So it was, you know, people were kind of like all got paid at the same time. And it was like a pretty. So what does it feel like when you're looking at your Bank of America bank account and you see m presumably millions of dollars pop in? Is that life changing? Yeah. I mean, of course, for us, it was, we had actually had a smaller exit. We had spun off this company called um, Social Cam, and uh, it had been acquired by Autodesk a couple of years earlier for 60 mil. And so, you know, I had gotten some liquidity before, but, you know, this was a orders of magnitude bigger. And so it was kind of like, um, you know, it was like, yeah, it was a life changer. It was, Does it, it was feel the way you would expect it to feel? Like, are you cheering or is there something bittersweet about it? No, for me, I'm not that sentimental. So like, <laughs> I was like, this is, this is sick. Like, I don't need to control, you know, the website or something like that. Or like, I'm willing to, you know, I'm not, I'm not a sentimental person really for the most part. So like, I was like ready to do new things and try new shit. And so, you know, it was, it, it felt great for about a month, right? Like it felt great. I remember I went like, you know, what it, like people are always like, what do you get? What, you know, I, I didn't like go nuts. I bought a house in San Francisco. San Francisco pricing would have been like a small island anywhere else. But I bought like a normal house in San Francisco and I bought a, um, I, we went, I remember we were in Italy for my friend's wedding, right? My co-founder. And so we went to like this Prada outlet. It's amazing. If you're ever in, in uh, Florence, there's this place, I forgot what it's called, but there's this like Prada outlet that's like a Costco of Prada. And then like, you know, kind of went nuts. It's great. <laughs> but it was, it was kind of like the Costco. So I felt like I was getting a great deal. You know? Yeah. And then that was it. That was, those were like, that's pretty much it. Because even now we're talking about your watch and everything. You don't wear a lot of brand name designer things. You're not very flashy at all. What was your relationship like with money growing up? Well, I had a scarcity mindset because my mom, you know, she was, uh, grew up in Malaysia, in rural Malaysia, and she had nine brothers and sisters. And so there was not a lot of resources, you know, her parents were very um, poor. And so there were not a lot of resources uh, for them. And so, um, she never felt like she had enough, you know, as a child. And then obviously you take those scars from when you're a kid into your adulthood. And then she communicated that to me. She would always be like, even though she made pretty good money, so did my dad, like, but like, she would always be communicating, oh, you know, we are not, we like don't have money or we're not the type of people who would do X, Y, or Z things that you know, people who had money would do. And so, you know, that left this impression on me as, a, and I had the scarcity mindset when I was, you know, a young adult where I, and I was like, oh, I got to make it. And I need to make money. And then also when I was a kid, I real, you know, I was, I always felt like an outsider. I, I never felt like I was really, you know, ex that accepted by the people around me. And so I had this concept of like, oh, if I make money, this is all subconscious. It wasn't really an idea that was at the forefront of my mind, but in the back of my mind, I was like, if I make money, if I'm successful, then people will like me, you know, they'll mm. accept me. And so I had this burning need to be successful. You know, obviously I kind of 
we exceeded how successful we'd become by a lot. Um, and yet it, it didn't really, you know, there was kind of like this glow for a month. It's like, oh, it's amazing, you know, and I got a lot of props from friends and, you know, whatever. But then at, at the end of it, it was like, now what, you know? It didn't create like a lasting sense of satisfaction. Did your parents encourage entrepreneurship or what do you think it was about your childhood that led you, all three of you, to become entrepreneurs? Well, I think it's like my mom, you know, my mom was an entrepreneur. She had her own small business, uh, a mortgage brokerage and real estate agency. And so, you know, we saw her like hustling when, when we were kids. And then, you know, I kind of, you know, I'm the eldest. So like I wanted to become a technology entrepreneur. And then really my brothers, like when they graduated, they they graduated in like in the middle of the um, like right after the GFC. So like they they were like, they couldn't find a job. So I helped them find, you know, paths in Silicon Valley. And that like kind of kickstarted them. being. Mm. And I think they just hung out with entrepreneurs. You know, you're the average of your five closest friends. So all my friends were entrepreneurs when they came over, you know, they were like, they were hanging out with people I knew. And so they just, it was natural to, you know. Are there any habits that you swear by to be successful? I feel like most of my good habits I adopted after I was successful. <laughs> So, you know, like, I think when I was younger, the thing that really made me successful was just, I was like, do or die. I'm like, this is my, I had a deep sense of personal responsibility for like what happened at the company, you know? But like today, when people ask me how, you know, what habits they should adopt, I'm always encouraging people like co-founders of mine or people I'm mentoring to adopt like a meditation practice, because I do think that helps you kind of create a disconnection from the external circumstances that are happening, whatever, if you're founding a company or you're starting a small business or you're anything, like you're taking responsibility for anything that's happening in your life, you're becoming a social, you know, trying to build a social media following or anything, there's going to be ups and downs, right? There's going to be stuff that's like great some days and then things that feel bad, right? Like you could, you know, with my YouTube, like some days, like the, sometimes the videos work, sometimes they get no views, like, and it's swingy, like, and anything, really anything worth doing, you know, anything that where you're putting yourself you're, you're risking, mm -hmm. um, you're putting yourself on the line, you're, you're taking risks, is going to be swingy. And so meditation really helps you deal with that without like, you know, getting completely crushed. And for me, before I had meditation, if I had something that was difficult going on, then I would just drink a lot. Like I was pretty much a functional alcoholic. So for me, I'd like, you know, I was a, I was a heavy drinker. And I think meditation has been able, allowed me to like find a healthier way to deal with like things not always going my way or, or difficult experiences. I've heard so many entrepreneurs tell me that I have to start meditating and it's really hard. I feel like I have this hyperactive mind where it's yeah. very difficult to sit down for 60 seconds and try to turn it off. Yeah. Headsp I know I guided, mean, I started with just with headspace. Yeah, you know? guided meditation is good, right? Yeah, I mean, I think like headspace is cool because it was like, they're just trying to get you to sit still for two minutes. That's, that's, or you, when you open this app, it's like, they're not trying to sit, get you to sit still for an hour. And I still can't, I mean, I'm, I could, I have, but I like have difficulty. Um, sitting still for an hour, but even just like the practice of noticing what your experience is, like what's your present moment experience? Like, how do you feel? Oh, I feel like maybe some tightness in my chest because I'm nervous about, you know, this podcast or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then just being present with it, you know, I think is is a helpful practice to like make it so that like your experience doesn't own you. I'm curious though, because I see a lot of successful founders say after the fact that, oh, I wish I would have treated my body better. I wish I would have cared more about mental health or had better habits. But it's very hard when you're in the building phase of a company to actually find that balance, right? Well, I think it's a little bit of an illusion because, you know, people are like, I don't have time. But like doing healthy practices gives you more time. You know, like you can't think 18 hours a day. You just can't. And you will, your, your, your body and brain will recover better if you take care of it. You know, it's like a car engine or whatever. So like I think meditation, exercise, like there's really no excuse not to do those things because you're going to get that time back and you're, you're maybe you'll do le less hours of work, but they will be more productive. Mm. You know? Now, that being said, a lot of people like myself included didn't do them and are saying do it after the fact. But I do wish, you know, genuinely I, I did. Did you ever deal with burnout or any of the things? Yeah, I was that burned out all the time. You know? <laughs> I was burned out all the time. Like every year I was like, I want to quit my company. It's I'm like, not, it's not working. You know, I was like, and I was very close many times. That's tough. Yeah, I mean, but you know, that's the journey for every human being. It's like you go through, like, it's easy for me to sit here and say, oh yeah, like you should meditate and take care of yourself. And, you know, people go through their own path. So yeah. I'm sure there's like entrepreneurs out there who are like, oh, that's you know, good for that guy. He's like, you know, people told me this when I was like younger or whatever. And I was like, oh, fuck, I'm just working on a company.
you know, like, I, and so <laughs> there's people out there who I'm sure are listening to this and they're like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out themselves. Yeah. But I think that's kind of the entrepreneurial mindset, right? Like we're yeah. all entrepreneurs because we are kind of rebels and want to try something new. If we weren't, we would be not doing this. Yeah, you'd be working as a lawyer or something. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So what are you excited about now? So after I had this realization, right, like I had these realizations about myself and like why I was such a motivated entrepreneur, you know, and it really all stemmed from wanting to connect with people. And so I kind of realized like I can just live my best life. You know, I don't need all the things I like focusing on the outcome and the goals, whatever, and external circumstances, like what's being successful or not that I'm doing. Like it's all kind of a recipe for making me less happy, you know? And really what I should focus on is living my joy, doing the things I love and connecting with people in a genuine and authentic way. And so for me, that was, those are like the things that I try to do every day. One of the things that you've been talking about a few times is finding partners who complement your skill set. So I guess my question that I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs are wondering is, one, how do you find what you're exceptionally strong at and what you're not so good at? And then how do you find the people to complement that? exercise that my CEO coach, uh, this guy, Matt Mochari, told me about one time, which is called the Zone of Genius. And it's a really great exercise where it's like uh, you, you know, the idea is like you want to do the things that you're good at, but also um, passionate about and give you energy. And so most people end up in the zone of competence, like a lot of lawyers, where it's like they're things that they're good at, but don't give them energy. That was occupying your time, right? And then you get burned out mm -hmm. enough. And so for me, you know, one of the ways that you can identify what's your zone of genius is just like do this thing called a calendar audit where you print out your last couple of weeks of calendar and just everything that gives you energy circle in green, everything that takes away energy circle in red, and then just what are the green things and how do you do those things and like focus on those things. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, I've been working in startups and entrepreneurship for a long time. And it just like became obvious, like what are the things that, I get energy from. I love storytelling and all of the different jobs that require storytelling. So customer sales, recruiting, you know, people, employees and people who work at your company, you know, doing press, uh, fundraising, like all those things are about telling the story of your company and getting someone to buy into that story. And so those are the things that really resonate for me. And so when I think about starting companies or projects, it's like, how do I focus on those things that give me joy? Mm -hmm. Like when I recruit, when I do like a recruiting call and I'm like selling someone on this like project I'm working on, if they don't join at the end of it or like the next week or whatever, I don't feel like I wasted my time. You know, I feel like, wow, I like got to connect with someone and I like, I got to hone my craft and I, I told them the story and they were like, usually they're pretty into it. So I'm pretty good at sales. So like, they, you know, I don't feel like I wasted my time. So for me, it's like, if I do all those things and, I, and it doesn't work, I don't feel like I wasted my time or my life. I'm just like doing things I love. Because that passion is there. It yeah. checks that box. Exactly. It's like the activities. You know, people often think about passion as what field do I want to work in? You know, they're like, oh, I'm passionate about healthcare or I'm passionate about like movies or TV or whatever, right? But I think it's more specific than that. It's like what activities do you like to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what specific tasks do you get energy from? And that's how I'd break it down and think about it, you know, when you're designing a career for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then what about building that team of team around you that has the complementary skill sets. Yeah. So for me, you know, the way I find collaborators is I, when I'm into something and into an idea, I just start talking about that uh, with everybody. You know, I'm ta I talk about it with everybody I'm, I'm like around and I just, because I'm into the idea, I'm always selling it. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm collaborating, when I'm working on a new idea, it's always about, I just talk about it to everyone. And then people, you know, come out of the ether to work together. You know, they're like, they just have some talent or set of skills. Usually it's on the product side that they're like, that they, that they're bringing to the table. And I just trial working with people by like, just seeing what it's like, you know, and yeah. if we're a good fit, we like working together, then that's usually how it goes. The companies you've started have been in all different kinds of industries, including legal and art and live streaming. How do you identify these opportunities? What specifically are you looking at when you're deciding whether this could be an opportunity worth pursuing? At first, it was more like, what do I think is a good business idea that maybe is enabled by some change in technology? That was at first. Now I'm probably, you know, saying those that like, what's a good business idea that's like enabled by some change in the world, but also like that I want to you know, I get about like, that's something that's like edifying for me to work on, you know? So I, you know, I think it's, I probably wouldn't start the legal startup again. I thought that was a good business idea, but like, it wasn't really my, like, I didn't 
care that much about legal. You had to hang out with too many lawyers. <laughs> yeah, it was probably not the right founder market fit for me, right? But yeah. and there's other companies that maybe, you know, are more like I'm really interested in culture and entertainment and that that kind of stuff. So the, those those kind of companies are maybe a little bit better fit for me. How did you decide going back to Twitch that Emmett would stay on and stay with the company? And you would go on to work with other projects. How are those types of decisions made? Well, it was really his baby, right? Because he was the one who came up with the idea for Twitch and was like focused on it. And he was the product genius who really brought it to market from what we had at Justin TV. You know, you kind of changed what we were and, and iterated. And so when it came down to like figuring out who should be the CEO of the company, it's like well, it's pretty obvious. Like the product, you know, in Silicon Valley, I think product CEOs are best, right? Somebody who's really focused on figuring out what the customers want, and delivering the customers what they need. And I think that was right. And so, you know, he was the right fit. And then for me at the time, I was very ego driven. I was like, oh, I want to be the CEO. And so I, I went and started a new company. But like now I'm like, I don't want to be the CEO ever. Again, you know? <laughs> Do you ever think that you will find one company that you're going to create and spend the rest of your life working on? Or are you so multi-passionate that you're going to continue to build a lot of different things in your life? Yeah, I mean, the truth is that's who I know who I am. And I'm like someone who loves new ideas. I'm the ideas guy. And I think I have some great ideas, you know, like some of these companies have become quite successful, but like, so I, I'm, you know, I, I want to work I, for a lot of these companies that, I, you know, the companies I'm starting now with other co-founders, like my intention is not like, oh, I'm going to be gone in a year. Like I want to work on them for a long time, but I like working on multiple things. Is there ever a point you think in 10, 20, 30 years where you're, you're where you're just going to say, okay, I want to live on a farm or I want to go no, I already do nothing. On a farm. <laughs> you don't think you'll ever quit though? No, I mean, I'm just like, you know, I like learning new things. And for me, work doesn't feel like work because it's I'm doing the things I like and it's my vehicle for learning. And I think that's how you stay young and your brain stays plastic, you know? So for me, I don't, it doesn't, like, I don't do things I don't want to do, you know, rarely in, in with regards to work anyways, like very rarely do I do things that I don't want to do. So it doesn't feel like, like, why would I change anything? I'm doing the things I like to do, you know? And it happens that they could be, money making things or you know but to me that's not really the important part what's driving you then because obviously you have enough money to cover you for the rest of your life is do you are you still driven by the success or the need for validation or what what does drive the motivation no it's it's living i try to live for my joy you know what do i like you know i love certain activities and and like selling stuff right like i just like and telling people evangelizing like for me like if i had opportunities to do that in a day then like that's great that's a good day you know and I love learning about new ideas. And I do like working on product strategy and stuff like that as, as well. And I like mentoring. So like for me, I'm also like the mentor of my co-founders a lot of times because I usually have more business experience at this point in my career. And so, you know, I get to do the things I like to do every day. So it's, you know, I'm not, I, I'm just like living my joy. And then if it doesn't, you know, I'm kind of faith, I have faith that like some of these things will make money, but like it, it kind of doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. A lot of it's like it's like when people people want to retire and then spend their time doing their hobbies, right? Like I don't know, golfing or traveling or whatever. But I spend all my day doing my hobbies, which is like starting companies and you know, making content and like whatever. So like I'm living my retired life. How I think <laughs> about it. Yeah. No, I love that. Obviously for you, the storytelling has been very instrumental in the success. Do you have any tips for people, entrepreneurs listening who may not be as good at storytelling and presenting their brand. And that's why maybe they're not finding the funding or the success that they need. Well, so, you know, one, the, the most impactful advice I ever got about storytelling was someone told me that every story in human history has is the same format, right? It has three acts. First act is like the world's a certain way. Act two is something changes. Act three, the world's a new way, right? And that's like the hero's journey. That's like every story. And so when you think about selling your business, can create it's it should be follow that format and that's what makes a compelling story so every time i think about a story you know about more in the context of like a business or something like that or make a pitch then it like should go into that you know that format what about for the famed 30 second elevator pitch would you approach it the same way yeah everything is that way right it's like it's like people don't care about something unless there's change right every story has changed so you know whatever the format whether you have 30 seconds or 30 minutes it's got to follow like people it, I follow an arc where there's like something is like there's 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 a background and then there's a change and then there's like a new state you mm. know and everything follows that the other th advice is like you got to own you know who you are right 
I do think that's the coolest thing about everything you built at Twitch. And now what I've seen with TikTok is people do like authenticity. Exactly. That's the right? internet right now. People like real people, like people who are human beings who like they connect with. That's like they, and when you look at like even, you know, the people who do the best on social media, they have some aspect of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's super important and it's good. That's pretty crazy though, that thinking back in 2007, 2006, before we had everything that we know in social media now, you were already onto that. I think that was a core insight. Yeah. I give myself credit for that. That was a, that was a good insight. That is. I could have like, I don't know, probably built Snapchat or something if I was smarter, but. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Snapchat's not doing so well anymore, is it? I mean, it's still worth like thirteen billion dollars, yeah. right, or something. It's I guess not bad. Relative, yeah, everything's like, relative. Yeah. <laughs> do you think you'll do ever another company in the social media realm? I don't know. Never say never. I do think social media is a matured industry now. I think usually as an entrepreneur, the opportunities are in places where that are, there aren't huge companies where there's like it's a new there's change, right? Like it's it's kind of the same thing. It's like social media was empowered by. First, everyone getting on the internet, then everyone getting a mobile. Well, everyone's already on the internet and mobile. So like the idea space, the, the white space is less. Mm. You know, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's a lot less. If you look at TikTok, TikTok spent hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising to even get to where it was. So like it was already starting to be a red ocean and they're like maybe last. I don't know, maybe not. But I think, you know, it's kind of like starting a new oil company. Well, there's a lot of oil companies. What's your like? What's your edge? Maybe there is. Maybe there's some technology edge, but like I don't know what it is yet. Yeah. What's your best advice for entrepreneurs? I mean, my best advice for people who want to be entrepreneurs is like you just got to get started. You know, oftentimes there's barriers to start. You're like worried if your idea is good enough or you have like you're gonna have, you don't have momentum, right? The key to starting is just build momentum. So you got to just go and do it. You know, get started. Like, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this. Like, if you want to, you know, you just post some social media if you're, you know, or, or like start working on a product or like talk about it with your friends and like start to like build momentum towards execution because that's the like first step is the hardest. Mm. And once you are an entrepreneur, I think my best advice is like to figure out ways to make it so that you can go the distance because this shit takes a long time. And, you know, one of those ways, in my opinion, that you should start is meditation because right? it helps you not get owned by the swinginess. But, um, you know, there's lots of other things to do. You know, so if, if you can figure out how to, like, disconnect yourself from, like, the ups and downs of the day-to-day -day, and then just remember, like, it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's, like, you know, I think that's, uh, that's key. I love that. So we have a closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Justin Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away from this podcast being able to say, Justin taught me this? You know, if 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 there was one thing that I hope people walk away with, it's that like there's no light at the end of the tunnel that's going to solve all your problems as an entrepreneur, right? It's like people think if I just sell my company for a billion dollars, if I become successful, I'll be fine, right? And the fact is, you're probably already fine now, and you'll be fine if those things don't happen. And external circumstances can never create lasting satisfaction in your life. And if you want lasting satisfaction in your life, it has to come from within. That was so wise. Thank you for doing this. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.